Are you ready to take action to attain the lifestyle of your dreams? It's a great way to make a lot of money fast, fast, fast. Hey, what's going on, Clever Investors? Sperber here. Welcome back to the Clever Investor Show. Today, I'm so excited. We have two of my favorite people in the real estate space and returning guests. And both of their episodes are some of my better episodes that I've ever filmed. We've had more engagement and uh, positive feedback because today in the Clever Investor Studios, we got the great Vina Jetty and the amazing Pace Morby. Bro, thank you for having us. Yes. Dang, I feel this is, we, we're making a Vina sandwich right now. This is this is like a <laughs> something I've always gift. wanted to do. I know. Wow. I'm the ham of the sandwich. <laughs> well, you're definitely the most successful person in this room right now. I don't Vina. think that's true. You're, you're the smartest. I don't think that's true. Where have you been, by the way? Like, where, have, where were you three in years ago? Four, I, I know you're in my guest house now. <laughs> But like I, yeah, well, I was introduced. How to you come by I've Sperber? never lived in your guest house? Like because well, you have a whole ass house here. Yeah, in I Arizona. do. Have a house. Yeah, you have a you have <laughs> like a house a that's as large as my neighborhood. Yes. Just so everybody knows, that's listening that don't doesn't know Pace yet. You're gonna fall absolutely in oh. love with him, and he is uh, probably the most hospitable person I've yes. ever met. He, yes. People just randomly like use your cars and yes. probably wear your clothes and live in your guest house. And then you went and bought a bunch of other houses yeah. using creative finance. Yeah, I did. Yeah. To, in order to have an overflow of people, random people yes. that just are part of your community <laughs> that I love bought, you. I bought my house, has a guest house. It's like a three bed, three bath guest house. It's amazing. It's Massive. like bigger than my regular house. I, yeah, of I course. Bought, why I bought this be? house. I bought, I used creative finance to buy it. And I, the main reason I bought it is for the guest house. And then all of a sudden, my guest house is booked out all the time with my friends. And I'm like, I could better buy a car. So I bought a Kia Sub 2, left it in the guest house. That was being used all the time. So then I had friends come in and go, you got any houses for me? I go, man, I better buy one. So I went out. <laughs> I bought two more houses that could be used as overflow houses. One's a two-bed, two-bath. Bought it Sub 2. The other one is a five-bed, three-bath. I bought it sub two and I bought sub two cars and put both of those in the houses. <laughs> and they're literally right? just my friends going through the houses, <laughs> like living in them. And here's the great. best part about all that. He documented the whole entire thing yes. and uh, turned it into a mountain of content. And Pace is doing, he's the king of community building, the king of content. And I told you from For day sure. one, when I, 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 I saw you day one, I said, you're going to be the biggest dog in the game. For sure. Someday. Hands I knew down. it instantly. And you're putting Hands in the down. work to do it. You are the king of community and you are the queen of multifamily. Yeah, you're amazing. Yeah, it, unbelievably amazing. I mean, I love amazing. both of you guys back. So. I know. All right. So look, uh, I want to unpack some of that stuff because it's kind of interesting. Like, I want to talk about some things that are happening in the economy. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about... Uh, Multifamily, obviously, Ooh. we got to we got to get into the weeds <laughs> and all that. We just just uh, my dad even sent me the article today about the big foreclosure. Four hundred million dollars is that what it was? They got defaulted in Houston. Is that what? You're yeah, about? yeah. It, he sent me that article, and I two hundred million, two hundred million. Four, it's probably as close to four hundred. I read this morning. Also. It's one trillion dollars in commercial mm -hmm. loans are set to have to be refinanced in the next twenty four months. Yep. So to one trillion dollars. Houston apartment yep. owner loses thirty two hundred units to foreclosure as multifamily wow. fills the heat. Yep. Wall Street to Arbor, Journal. To Arbor Group. That happened last week. Yeah. Now, for people that are in single family, Vina, yes. I don't think they truly understand what the hell that means because <laughs> they're we're we're thinking like, okay, well, if your tenants are paying, why uh, would all of the sudden, if you have thirty two hundred doors, why would yep. you go into foreclosure if you have paying tenants? What has changed between six months ago and today is not his tenants paying or not. It no. ha what has changed? It's interest rates. Interest rates have just shot up and people don't have rate cap insurance. And because mm. two years ago, three years ago, no one thought interest rates were ever going up except for you when you were speaking about it last year and you were like, interest rates are going to be 8%. And I was like, Cody, you're crazy. What are yeah. you talking about? But that's exactly what happened. Debt doubled and they have adjustable rate Mortgages. Okay, so they are they have secured mortgages. They put thirty two hundred people in these these properties. Yep, they're all paying rents. Yep, and then the interest rates shoot shoot up on the ex existing debts. <laughs> Double now they're not cash flowing. They're yep. hemorrhaging money. Yep, they go f this, and they're letting these properties go. They just can't service the debt. So do you agree with this? The sub headline is building values are falling. So their mm -hmm. their their values are going down. Interest rates are rising, and rent growth is slowing. All three things combined, yeah, because putting some people in a pickle. Building values are based off of cap rates, right? And there is about like a 60 or 70% correlation to interest rates increasing to cap rate expansion. So yes, building values are falling because cap rates are going up. They're inverse, right? And so what is going to end up happening is 
over time, they're going to really restabilize and debt is probably going to start either plateauing or coming back down. So it will come back to normal. This is cyclical. All real estate is. It's always been. But what is normal, right? Because a lot of people think that like the last couple of years was normal. No. 3%, 2% interest no. rates. I've got so many 2 and 3% sub two no. deals over the last couple of years. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Like I went to four properties yesterday. All of the properties were under 3%. Yet in multifamily, when you say go back to normal, what does go back to normal mean? You know, I think- 6%? Yeah, I think like- Five, six percent, we can make deals work. Um, right now, we're starting to kind of see interest rates kind of coming back down slightly, not a whole lot. Nothing I'm holding my breath over because I'm sure the Fed's going to increase the rate again. It's got to happen. Yeah, it's, they're going to increase the rate again. So I think it's maybe like even short term pressure again. But I think as we've had a lot of real estate tourists come into the space recently, right? Real estate, what is a real estate tourist? You know, like there are the people that are like, oh, I have this other thing I do and I do this on the side for like 10 hours mm. a week. It's like a full-time job. I spend a hundred hours a week doing only multifamily. And so the people that kind of are just like casually in the space are going to be the ones that are going to kind of step out of the space now and we can continue operating. So what's the play? I think the play, well, I actually think the play is creative finance right now. That's been the play, but like what's what what's the new play? But that is a play on multifamily assets and that doesn't happen very often on right. large assets. You just bought a deal last year that was a Big multifamily. Yeah, 256 units, Illinois, $20 million, all seller finance, no money that. out of my pocket. Let's uh, let's talk about that because I think it's really interesting. Um, a lot of people don't know this, that 34% of all single family homes and condominiums in the United States are owned free and clear. I wonder how many multifamily properties have are owned free and clear, like smaller multifamily. Smaller ones, probably way more. Larger like ones, four it's plexes, hard. eight plexes, yeah, 10, you know, 12, 32, 12 plexes, yeah. maybe under 100 units, probably a significant portion. Yeah. So is that the kind of deal you found or was there debt on it? And then you you were getting creative with the the equity? Seller had it paid debt? off on that one. But walk us through that transaction. Okay. I, so seller, uh, here's what happens with these small mom and pop investors. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what they do is this particular seller owned corner stores, right? Grocery mm -hmm. stores. So he's making a bunch of money. His CPA is like, yo, dude, you got too much of a tax liability. We yep. need to get you into real estate and get you a full-time exemption for real estate. We need to get you depreciation. We need to get you all these things. He's like, okay, I'm not a real estate investor, but I'll just start dumping money into real estate, multifamily. So he starts buying assets. 20 years later, he's sucked out all the cash flow out of these. He's not fixed a single roof. They haven't upgraded any of the units. And they're like, okay, we're ready to sell these. <laughs> Okay. Problem is now you're le leaving all this pile of junk for somebody else. And so the numbers that they want to sell at are unattainable, mm -hmm. right? They're like two or $3 million off. So they were getting, they had it listed for 16.9 million and they were getting offers at like 11 million, 12 mm -hmm. million, 13 million at the very top, but it had a bunch of concessions. You need to fix a bunch of stuff. So I came along and I said, Hey, you know how I found it? One of your members of your community? No. Or? Are you going to say like loop that? No, well, LoopNet oh. is pretty fun to be on, but that's not where I got the deal. I got the deal by somebody on my team, my acquisition team saw all the buildings. There's 41 buildings. They all have different colored roofs. Mm. What does that tell you? That they were acquired over time. They were hodgepodging their repairs yeah. over time. So it tells you a story, right? Everything comes down to a story of the property. It's all the same asset? All the same asset. Oh, 41 buildings, okay. 256, un yeah. two, 256 units. So the average building has like six to eight um, yep. apartments in it, right? So you see all these different color roofs. It tells you that the home, the property owner is saying, yeah, I'll fix, I'll fix what I have to fix rather than actually being right. intentional about the investment. So we came to them and said, hey, we'll, we'll take that at $16.9 million, but we want $0 down. Mm. Seller says, no. Three months later, we pitch them again. We'll do it for $16.9 million, $0 down. Seller says, well, I need money. I need skin in the game. I need to know that you're going to mm -hmm. do what you say you're going to do. I can't just give a $16.9 million deal to anybody. I said, how about this? I go get $2 million because that's what I'm going to put into renovating the property. And I put that into an escrow account and that is considered my down payment. That's my skin in the game. Right. So my renovations going into a, rent, a, a escrow account gave him the security to know I was only going to be able to use that money for the renovations. renovations. Which is brilliant because you're renovating your own deal. Yeah. I'm renovating my own deal. Yeah. And worst well. case scenario for his side is he says, look, if you default for whatever reason, I get the money in the escrow account and the property and I get the property yeah. back and I get any renovations that you did up until that mm -hmm. point. And so 
Guess what? We already we've already renovated the property. Rents all are all of it. All of it. Yeah. You just bought that like two days ago. We bought it six months ago. Wow. Yeah, we bought that six months ago. That's a quick turn. It was a quick turn. So come um, on, you know Pace. He doesn't mess around. Gosh, that's true. What that's was what was here was here's what was great about it is that the seller didn't want to close escrow until 2023. So what we did mm-hmm. is what we call a dating contract. Mm, yeah. Okay. So what we did is essentially it's like a lease option, but we did an agreement for sale that stated that he keeps the deed in his name until January 1st of 2023. Mm. So I was already working on the property for four months before that. Mm. And then the deed transferred into my name on January 1st so that the tax liability rolled into 2023. And um, the sale was shown as 2023. So then we were already four months deep into it and we're already now going through and now as tenants are um, primary, most of the tenants have all gone out and the rents have all been raised. Wow. So it's a 40 year note. 3% 3% interest, $0 down to the seller, $2 million in escrow, all went and renovated the property. So any single person that's listening to this podcast right now, just remember what my mentor always used to tell me, which is in real estate, you never have a money problem. No. You only never. have a creativity problem. Yes. And once you really understand what Pace just taught you, to look at the deals, the opportunities through a totally different lens, this person had a challenge. An older building, didn't know what to do with it, wasn't getting full price offers, was stuck on price. And here comes Pace and offers something totally different and got told no. Yeah. But can, can but followed up. He stayed persistent yeah. and say, let's try this again a few months later. Let's see if the temperature changed. And that's where a lot of people break down. They don't even get to the yeah. opportunity to even pitch something because they get told no and they just move on or get shut down. You came back, you hit it again. And then again, there was an objection. I don't believe that you're, you, you need skin in the game. I don't believe you're going to do what you say you're going to do. Right. And you thought creatively again and said, hey, I don't want to hand you $2 million, but if I could come up with a creative way to repair my own property, show you that I'm serious about right. this, boom, he says, yes, win, win, win. Mm-hmm. And right. that's the ultimate way to structure deals. Yes. So what a what a creative that way. That's awesome. Now, how many times can we do that in the multifamily space over the next three three to five years? What We're going to find here's, out. <laughs> here's what I find is the challenge. So I have another deal in Corpus Christi we closed last year, same exact way. So seller, his name's Mario, um, 30 unit multifamily down in Col- Corpus Christi, two blocks from the beach, great deal. It's worth 2.6. Mm-hmm. I paid 3 million, mm-hmm. right? And most people, when I first started, same thing with you and you, it's like, hold on, no, 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 I got to get a deal on this. Well, I did get a deal. Because what I structured was a 50-year note. So I have a fit, like my payment is incredibly low. Zero dollars down to Mario. But how, same thing. I gave him $150,000 into escrow. Okay. Great deal for me. The problem is the once you acquire the asset, you now have to manage that asset. Mm-hmm. And you now have to renovate that asset. Mm-hmm. And then you have to raise the rents on that asset. Deal with horrible tenants that you have to move out. Right, because you've acquired assets in the past where you're like, man, we literally just need to go through and and purge thirty percent of these bad tenants that aren't paying bills, or maybe they're spoiled, or they've got they're letting their friends into the complex and they're parking eighteen cars and (laughs) like they're not their parking spots. Yeah, the challenge is once you buy multifamily is the onboarding process of a deal to get it stabilized. Yeah. I mean, I think the operations of any multifamily asset, like that's really the execution piece. That's the hardest part of the deal, in my opinion. It's not so much acquiring them or financing them. It's how are we going to get from point A to point B in a practical way? And, you know, on your deals, when you have such a long time frame on your debt, Mm -hmm. I mean you could not do anything and just sit and wait for 50 years and it'll appreciate, right? That's, like that's, that's my, th- see, this is where single family and multifamily, there's that common question. Yeah. Like, should I start with single family and multifamily? Where I don't love multifamily is where I'm afraid of these ticking time bomb debts that you guys have. Yeah, You guys, it's like, okay, I'm, we're going to go acquire this asset, but most people are acquiring with bridge debt of like five, seven years. Is that? Previously, three to five years. Bridge. Three to five yeah, years. It's- so it's like, here, here's a ticking time bomb. Enjoy. <laughs> but I promise interest rates won't go up. Yeah. And I promise that everything's going to be fine in the economy, but here's a ticking time bomb. You can't weather a storm with a three-year no. balloon. No, it's it's like a hot potato almost, right? Mm, that's Who's a great going to be holding it when the rate expires and interest rates are going up? Whereas single We're family, right now. I look at single family and I go, I'm not afraid of the debt. I, even if the 2008 crash happened, if you look back at all the people that lost properties, here's what was happening. 
they were still cash flowing, mm -hmm. but all of a sudden they lost all this equity and they go, I don't want this property anymore. And they let go of all these houses. Okay. You look at those investors, if they had held on to those properties over, what was that, 15 years ago? Yeah, they would have been fine. The properties would have paid down 70% of their debts and the delta or the appreciation going up would have doubled. Yep. But they would have made tens of millions of dollars. Yet people get fearful with equity. Like it, lack of equity or the people are like, I'm trying to, you know who doesn't buy property with equity? Anybody. <laughs> Look at the anybody that buys a deal on the MLS. Any homeowner that buys a deal on the MLS, have they are they buying with equity? Or are they paying over over retail value? If I'm a homeowner, I go to an uh, an agent and go, I want to buy a house for my family. Am I paying under market value or above market value? You're paying at market value. No. Because you, you're paying above. You got closing value. costs. You're paying oh, above market. Okay, you got yeah, all yeah, these additional things. You start underwater. Things. Yeah. Technically, you under, start underwater. Yeah. That's 99% yeah. of all retail purchases. Yeah. So people out there are like, well, Pace, aren't you worried about equity? No, homeowners don't have equity. Yeah. People don't have equity in their houses. I did not buy a property for equity. The tenants are there to give me equity as they pay down my debt. The problem with multifamily that I'm fearful of, and this is why I have become friends with you from your relationship and in introducing us. I'm fearful of multifamily from that one side is like the quality of the debt it's is a ticking time bomb. But the, and there are debt products that do work in long term horizons, but there's, you know, it's a pick your poison situation. Mm -hmm. It's you're trading one concern for another in multifamily. But what multifamily does that single family doesn't is it gets you to scale fast. Mm. And sometimes you lose 30. Lose yeah. It and it's really dollars. hard to get to a tax-free situation, especially yeah. if you're making a lot of earned income yeah. using single family. You can right. get there so Very much tough. faster with commercial. I, I wanted to touch on something that you brought up though, because I think it's really important because what we're really talking about for anybody who's new and doesn't really, they're trying to keep up with this podcast because we're, we're, we're talking fast, yeah. is there's two ways to buy a piece of real estate, cash or terms. Right. And when you approach it from the understanding of, hey, it's not just trying to get this screaming deal where I beat the seller up on price, and which is the hardest thing to negotiate in every transaction is price. You have to have somebody really desperate or really motivated or in a lot of financial pain, or the house is so beat up and distressed that you can't even qualify for a traditional yeah. mortgage before you can get somebody down 30, sometimes 35, 40% off of mm -hmm. retail. Whereas if when you're coming in with cash or with terms, you're like, I'll overpay. You just said, I paid more than yeah. what the property was worth. Smart. Everybody listening to this would go, well, why would you ever do that? Well, because the cash flow made sense. That if you just look at like, what is the what are the levers I can pull in a transaction? And you said, we did a 50-year mortgage. And that's right. what I wanted to zero in on. There's three levers you can pull in a, in a mortgage with, with, when it comes to financing. Down payment, interest rate, length of loan. FHA just came out with a, a Ooh, article the other 40 day. 40 years. FHA <laughs> greenlights 40-year mortgages. Why think would about, they why would they do that? Think about first? what's happening. It's going to because affordability is out of control and it's going to reduce monthly mortgage doing. payments <laughs> as um has been, you know, rates have been going up. And uh, redfin.com reports over the last year the average mortgage payment has risen 30% to mm -hmm. a record yeah. $2,563 a month. A 40-year mortgage now stretches that payment out over a longer period of time, making the payment lower. And then bank rate came in and said, look, let's just compare a 30-year to a 40-year loan. That a $312,000 loan at a 6.85% interest rate, the monthly payments were $2,044 for a 30-year loan and $1,904 for a 40-year loan. So you're just, you're not dropping it that much but you're dropping it. Yeah. yeah. And this is the future. There will be 50-year loans. I, I agree. It will ha probably happen. So I'm already creating them. <laughs> I was yeah. going to say, they Pace heard been what doing Pace is doing one. and that's why they came up with this product. You know, but, but it, here's, it is the like here's what people don't get. That extra 10 years adds also close to $170,000 more in interest payments over time. Right. <laughs> so people think they're getting a deal. But you know right. what they say, like, marry the property, date the rate. Like, okay, it's 6.75 right now. It could be 5% in the future and you can refi it. But here's the problem with marry refi. Marry the property, date the rate. Yeah, this is yeah. what this is what a lot of more, uh, mortgage officers are saying as they're getting completely Going annihilated. out of business. <laughs> I'm sorry for anybody that's an LO out there, you're a processor or an underwriter working for an LO. Date the rate is essentially what you're saying. What I fear for that, because I used to be an LO, yeah. is I would watch people come in and do refinances, cash yeah. out refinances on their personal homes. 
And these houses had like been paid down for 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. They already took over the, they paid the majority of their interest in the first 12 years and they go, oh, I have equity now. And what do they do? They go back and restart Start. their loan where now their interest is like 87% of their payment is interest. So yes, you can, but then you're also pressing the reset button on your pay down. Yeah, but then you can take that cash and go invest it somewhere else that's going to make you more money. But here, here, let me tell you something, okay? This is what's cool about that $2 million that I did for the 256 unit. Did I have the $2, $2 million to do that? I know the equity source, so I know the answer already. <laughs> I, I do not. I did not have the $2 million to do that deal. So what did I do? I didn't go. So I have all these single family properties that have what I call a delta. The delta between I bought the property for 300 today. It's worth 300 today. Over time, the property pays down to 200. Over time, the property also goes up to 400. So I've got a delta of 200. Some people would call that equity. Equity, yeah. Okay. It's the delta between what I owe and what the house is worth. Okay, great. So I go to the seller and I go, well, I don't have the $2 million. So I'm going to go raise the capital. And the seller says, well, if you raise the capital, I don't want a second lien position on this property because I'm seller financing mm -hmm. you the $16.9 million. I go, no problem. So what do I do? I go and create liens on my, my single properties. family properties that have deltas on them without a cash out refinance. Yep. And I just put notes and deeds of trust against the equity on those properties to then go raise that 2 million bucks. So you can still use your equity without refinancing. True, but in a primary home, it's a lot harder that to is do correct. This. That is correct. So- so You're just slicing and dicing, man. Just <laughs> That's trying it. to figure out creative ways to do it. He doesn't take no for an answer. Yeah, I mean, and and a great way for people to start if they're newer is download a mortgage calculator mm -hmm. and just start fidgeting with it. If I change it to, from a thirty year to a forty year, what happens to a payment? If I right. change, if I go from two percent yeah. interest to four percent interest, what happens to the payment? You know, if I put zero down versus ten thousand dollars down, and you start becoming good at pulling those levers. And I also want to stay, uh, say that over 53% of every mortgage in the United States was created after 2020. Oh, that makes sense. Everybody refied during right. the boom. Yep. And they either own it free and clear or the majority of people have these phenomenal two, three, four percent mortgages. Right. Right. And that's the new gold rush. Yeah. This is why I love that you saw very early on this sub two craze that was going to come before it even happened. Yeah. You were already thinking, okay, w every market cycle changes every 15 to 18 years. The, uh, you're looking, reading the tea leaves going, this is going to be huge. Mm -hmm. And that is really the gold rush. Yeah. Um, so people are like, you're so lucky. I go, I had to be patient for six years. Yeah. Do not tell me I'm lucky. I was, I was patient through all of that process. And persistent. I was the only one talking about sub two for like three, four years. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> everybody wants to talk about sub two. I want to talk about sub two. Of course. <laughs> but it, it, here's, here's the other thing too, okay? If I'm brand new and I'm like, okay, cool. You guys are talking high level. Guys, it's very basic. Do you want to wholesale? Do you want to fix and flip? Or do you want to buy and hold? Those are the three ways you make money in real estate. You had a graph that I just saw you made that I was like, oh, I like this. You had like a four- so it's called my four square Hot strategy good. matrix. It was one of the first teaching tools I created when I, I love started it. education. So yeah. Steal it. Can you explain it to me? Well, I mean, just think about it. You have four squares and the top left is wholesaling or quick flipping. And then in the, in the right square, that's the left square, top left. Top right is rehabbing for bigger paydays. Bottom left is all the creative stuff, taking mm -hmm. over people's mortgages, working. It's called seller participation. That's anytime we can get a seller to participate and giving us the financing no, needed. Right. That's either they own it free and clear or they have a mortgage on it and they're, you know, sub twos, wraparound mortgages, even sandwich lease options. That all goes in that bottom mm -hmm. left bucket. And then the traditional go to a bank, borrow money and buy and be a landlord is in the bottom right-hand corner. And if you think about the matrix, those are the four main ways to kind of get into a, a deal. But some of them need little to no money. Some of them need money. Some of them produce quick cash and paydays. Mm -hmm. And some of them are long-term wealth building tools. And it became a matrix. It's like, who are you? Well, I don't have any money. And so that means it's these two left columns. I either got to do wholesaling or I got to do creative. Yep. Because I don't have money. Yeah. And then what do I want my outcome to be? Either quick cash or long-term buying or wealth building. And it's really easy just to find your box and go, this is the game I'm going to play. So I got to master all these skills and tools and resources that sign, make this game work. The sign of a great educator is somebody who stops and says, who are you before mm. they answer the question? Because every the reason why real estate is so challenging for people is because they don't have a mentor or somebody stopping going, who are you? I had a girl, um, she makes $300,000 a year as a programmer. 
and she's sitting there trying to become a wholesaler. I'm like, mm. hold, hold, what are you, hold on, what are you doing? Yeah. Do you hate your job? And she goes, no, I love my job. I'm like, <laughs> then you're not a wholesaler. Right. You should go out and you should acquire real estate. Well, I have, I'm tight on cash. I'm like, well, first off, you shouldn't be at $300,000 a year. You should right. have some cash. But then I said, you're a buy and holder. She's like, wow, I, I guess nobody broke that down for me. Mm. People really have to stop and go, well, who am I? Are there some steps for people to figure that out? Like, who am I? Do I have money? What is my goal? Ca cash today or cash tomorrow? Are those the th three main things that you ask people? Well, the first question I normally ask people is, how are we going to retire from real estate? Mm. Mm, because like what's the end I, I want to understand their end game. Retire like, because of real estate. Yeah, like yeah. we're done. We we now did it. Magic wand. Financial independence. We're done now. Yeah. Like we're financially independent. What does that look like for you? Mm. Is it a certain amount of money coming in? Is it a net worth on a piece of paper? Is it consistent? Uh, is it, you know, you you hit a certain milestone as far as I made $3 million. Once I hit $3 million, I'm out. Mm. And that tells a lot about how we're going to get there. And we can start to backwards engineer into that. I think that was smart for you to kind of challenge her and say, hey, you got a great job. You are you don't hate your job. You're not going to give up your job. How much time and resources do you really have? Wholesaling is a very uh, intensive, time intensive yeah. business. Very hard to do it if you're not willing to put in the time. Right. And so, um, yeah, we actually, I, I hired some psychologists back in the day and we created a whole entire, almost like, um, not a quiz, but like a, Personality style. It was like a, yeah. Like a, a, yeah. a matrix or yeah. something mm -hmm. like that. Like a, a mind map. Yeah. Exactly. And we still have it. And then I, 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 I tried to get students to use it. And what I found is they were, <laughs> they weren't, they weren't going through it and actually I, applying it. <laughs> That's really interesting. I did this too. It's almost I, too complicated. I, I did it. Well, because you're trying to give people information and they're not ready to digest That's it here, quite yet. Yeah. So they have to kind of go through the process. I did the same thing. I created a, an avatar mm. list of 22 different personality types. Where should they focus their time and energy and how could they get their hands on a deal based on that avatar? <clears throat> so even transaction coordinators, right? There's personality types that are like, I'm really great at paperwork. Mm -hmm. Not you, not me. <laughs> mm. Okay. So we rely on them. I have five transaction coordinators that all work for me full-time just based on the amount of deals that we're doing. And I taught, okay, well, even if you are that personality type, doesn't mean you have to only be a transaction coordinator. It means you get to look at deals before anybody else gets right. to look at deals. So why not utilize that as a way to get your hands on deals, maybe dispo, maybe choose to buy some of those deals from your clients. Any, anyway, I went through 22 different personality types and I go, all right, choose one avatar to start with for 90 days. Then you can adopt some other avatars as you gain more skills. What people do is they go in and they go, I'm nine of those avatars. I'm like, no, 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 no. You can't be nine. Pick one. You can't be nine, you freaking shiny object. Like you're like a gnat following the light. You can choose one and then adopt and learn new skills based on what you learn through that process. And that's a really hard thing for people is they just, they want to know it all so fast mm -hmm. and they're not willing to put in the work to, to focus on one thing at a time. It's hard to say no to. Yeah. Right. Like, because you hear everybody like, oh, I'm wholesaling, I'm fixing and flipping, I'm developing, I'm making money, multifamily. Like, and you're like, no, you're stressing me out. Yeah. Is what you're doing. <laughs> That's why when people ask me, I'm like, I only do one trick. If it is not about multifamily, do not ask me. I will connect yeah. you to the people that know the other things and I invest my money with those people and I don't know anything about it. Yeah. yeah. Especially when it comes to wholesaling. Wholesaling, yeah. wholesaling is like a great gateway drug. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, let's get in the game. Let's learn some language. Let's meet some people. Quick let's money. potentially make a little bit of money. Yeah. You're going to learn very quickly whether you're cut out for this business or not. Yeah. It's no different than going door to door and selling solar. Right. Like it's a grind. Yeah, you can make a ton of money. Awesome. And, and, and eventually, if you stay at it long enough, you can build systems and processes and team. And like people are like, you know, kind of dumbfounded, like, because I don't even know when we're wholesaling or what we're wholesaling. I'm just like, oh, we made 80 grand yesterday. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not actually, I'm whole, wholesaling. I own a wholesale company, but I'm not actually wholesaling. Right. Right. Which is like where that's everybody wants to eventually Yeah, get that's to. the goal. <laughs> but trust me, somebody's banging their head against the phone. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> trying to get a hold of the seller right now. Yeah, you have eight VAs. <laughs> yeah, we got a bunch of VAs. Yeah. And, a, and, a, and a, we got eight VAs and a, a giant tub of Leads, <laughs> leads. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I want to switch topics a little bit, and then we'll come back to multifamily. Um, dude, AI is making kind of crazy waves yeah. right mm. now. Everybody's jumping on the AI bandwagon. I've been working on my <laughs> AI offer for six months. I actually implemented AI in, into my business over two years ago. 
we were very early mm -hmm. adopters of AI. Um, what's your take on how is it going to disrupt the real estate space specifically? Um, I, I believe that it will remove the front end jobs. Probably 40, 50% of people will no, no longer have jobs in the front end. Front end meaning generating leads, doing mm -hmm. the follow-up, maybe even a lot of the paperwork, the contracts, those types of things. I think even at some point in the next five years that we own title companies. And I believe yeah. that AI technology will completely disrupt that entire industry. Yes. Right? Being able to pull title, being able to go through and, and dissect something better than a human being can. You've been in transactions, I know you have, where somebody said, you have clear title. Six worst. months later, something pops up because a human being missed something. Mm -hmm. Everything on the front end of a transaction is going to change. Mm -hmm. Everything. I agree. And so um, from a real estate investor standpoint, it's great because you can get your hands on way more deals, mm -hmm. deal with way less headache. My biggest problem in, a, in our acquisition company, I, same thing as you, we wholesale, but I'm never involved in any of the wholesale. What's the biggest problem you have in a wholesale business? You don't know? I have no idea. Acquisition people. Oh, okay. Okay, salespeople. Why? Because salespeople want to be you, Cody. Mm -hmm. They want to be me. And so they'll stick with you for six months, just long enough that they learn and absorb and all your stuff. Thing. Even take your buyer's list, mm -hmm. even take your stuff, pat you on the back and say, thank you for the help that you gave me. <laughs> Thanks for the training. <laughs> but you were, you're not really serving me. There's anymore. no love in this game. Right. There's no love in this game. No and loyalty. it's the front end. It's the lead generation. Mm. It's the closing, et cetera. AI can now do that better than a human being yeah. can, be, can. And somebody told me the other day, go, AI can't make calls like a great closer can. Mm, I go, yes, I can. <laughs> maybe not with the same human touch yet, because I think at some point there is going to be voice implementation they where people will, yeah. will, AI will yeah. actually get on the phone and talk to a human being and yeah. it will be so good. I think we're three years, maybe five years max away from that. But here's what I say about it. AI is one thing that human beings are not consistent. Mm -hmm. I would rather have an, a consistent robot or over an inconsistent human being. Mm -hmm. That's a great closer. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? I agree. Well, they can work 24 hours a day too. Yeah. You, you know what we did to solve our uh, people still on our buyers list problem? Every time we do a job interview, we have an actor that's wearing makeup and they look like they just got the shit kicked out of them and, and we drag them out of the room, the back room. <laughs> and we don't say much. We just let them see it. And then they're like, what's that? And be like, hey, you know, we crossed some boundaries with our buyers list and you know, kind of <laughs> fucked with us a little bit. We don't talk about that. It, it happens rarely, but when it does, we deal with it. <laughs> you just so happen to be that here was on the it. date. And then we move on. <laughs> Amazing. You lock them in right then. They're like, I ain't fucking with this guy. You're like, uh, um, let me have my resume back. <laughs> yeah, they're like, I, I, I will have another interview. <laughs> but I, I think also on the front end of comping, I think AI is like, you've got software right now that will score a property. Mm -hmm. And not just score a property, but talk about what you, AI will say, we believe based on these data points that this house is likely to sell at a discounted cash offer. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, look, machine learning is really interesting. You know, when we implemented it into our software, our goal was to cut lead costs down. That mm -hmm. was our goal. It's like, how do we find better leads? It was just a lead gen mm -hmm. thing. Is that because of skip tracing, virtual assistance, call, cold calling, follow-up costs, payroll? Is it's that expensive what that is? to find good potential deals, mm -hmm. especially when you're trying to wholesale. It, and especially if you don't have a creative mind mm -hmm. and you don't have those tools yet in that training to be able to make terms offers. And so it's like, all right, how do we find at scale quickly and efficiently uh, homeowners that are looking to sell at a discount within a next certain period of time? And so what we did is we created probability and propensity models and we looked at data that wasn't the traditional data, mm -hmm. right? Traditional data is, we've been using this for years. We call it big data. And we were like, okay, you know, we know that if you have a homo, or if you have 4 million homeowners in Phoenix, Arizona, metro area, um, I can't market to 4 million people. It's too expensive. But can I whittle them down into these little manageable buckets? And that's where the data came in. And it was mm -hmm. like, all right, let's just start putting them in buckets. Like who has equity? Who has a lot of equity? Right. Who maybe has a property that's vacant? Who's in foreclosure? Who's in probate? Who who's doesn't in, have equity? Who doesn't have <laughs> equity? Who's Who's got um, a weird property like um, a two bedroom, one bath in a neighborhood full of three twos? Mm -hmm. You know, just any Anomaly. physical, hardcore, old school data that has to do with like property records or homeowner records. 
all that data is out there. The title companies have it all. And so you can you can take that data and whittle people into buckets. And we were doing that for many years. It worked. And we would skip trace those homeowners and cold call, uh, cold call them. We would send them direct mail. We'd maybe paper click them, maybe look them up on social media and try and DM them. Just some way to get a hold of them. And that was the Me- whole- Meanwhile, you're paying payroll on all of those activities. Oh, it was very expensive. Mm-hmm. I mean, you we were spending tens of thousands of dollars a month every month consistently. And we weren't even the, I know some people are spending 50, 60, 80, oh, yeah. 100K a month, ah. no problem. Especially when it comes to pay-per-click. It can, it can get real expensive real quick. What's Direct a pay-per-click? Mail. Pay-per-click is uh, something us commoners do, yeah, Bina, that are oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in the actual have to work business. <laughs> Um, we, no, it's just taking, it's just running ads on Google and Facebook. Oh, pay per click. Yeah. I thought you were what saying did you like say? Pay paper, per view? like paper, like oh, you know, a sheet oh, of paper. paper click. Yeah, <laughs> is that why click. everybody? When I'm doing a YouTube live and I'm talking about PPC and I say pay per click, they are like, "What does that What's mean?" I'm like, a how click? do you not know what pay per click is? <laughs> You've literally clicked on it ten thousand times. Uh, yeah, pay pay, <laughs> pay per, per click. click. You have to Three enunciate, words. Cody. Enunciate. Um, uh, you still hold the. Smartest in the room title for now, but oh, you're for quickly sure. losing it, Dana. <laughs> for <degrading>. sure. <laughs> I'm like, hold my beer. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, you if you take, let's say we whittle a 4 million size bucket into 700 potential right. property records using this big data. Okay. That's more manageable. And we can uh, text them and cold call them and send them mail and maybe go door knock them or mm-hmm. run ads to them. Paper still, click them. Paper click them. <laughs> but it's still very expensive. And out of that, you might get one or two deals if you're really good, maybe three. Tons of follow-up involved and all that stuff, right? It's very time-intensive, aggressive. And there's a like, lot of psychology as well where you're... If you ever seen one of my hoodies, my hoodie, one of my most famous sayings is buyers are liars, mm-hmm. sellers are worse. Right. And so what you're also dealing with is a liar of a seller. <laughs> I'm sorry, they all, they all they are. They all are, no matter what. And um, they're saying, oh, you're the only person I'm talking to. Meanwhile, they have 50 other people. They're mm, taking yeah. your number and you know manipulating mm-hmm. and doing all that kind of stuff. So you're dealing with all of that on top of follow, right? You're just following up to people who are lying to you and you're chasing your tail all the time. Yeah. Meanwhile, paying payroll. Wow, this yeah. sounds hard. So it's a, it's a lot of work. <laughs> Welcome to the hard. real estate business. It's a grind. You kiss a lot of frogs yeah, to find your prints. That's mm-hmm. true. It, but at the end, then, but there's always an unfair advantage. And this is the thing. If you're an early adopter, especially of new technology, yeah. you can get out in front of the curve and scoop up a, a lot Everything, of deals. And yeah. I'm talking, here's the other, I mean, not to make this sound horrible. Yeah, it's a grind. Where else are you going to make? We did one deal, closed it last week, made $80,000, probably took, six hours worth of work. Mm. That did not exist. It did not exist in many industries. And for somebody who's maybe didn't graduate high school, never went to college, doesn't have a fancy office, doesn't have nice cars, you know, maybe lives in podunk, rural, wherever, but they have a computer, they have Wi-Fi, and they have a lot of hustle. They find pace online and they're like, oh my God, this guy's showing me the path. And they go put in the work Mm -hmm. and then they get one deal and make 80 Gs. It'll change your life. Yeah, And so- the back in the day, the unfair advantage was email marketing. I was the first in the country mm-hmm. to email market market at mass scale to ma- to cash buyers. We built the first email marketing platforms. We were collecting email lists. I taught myself direct response. Like we were gunning on email, and everybody was like, "How in the hell are you selling deals?" Well, nobody else was doing email marketing, and then it was like text message marketing. Then it was ringless voicemail. I was oh, the yeah. first in the country to do ringless voicemail. People, how are you doing your deals? I found a new competitive unfair advantage. Ringless voicemail. Nobody, you'll never hear anybody talk about that anymore. Well, yeah, yeah now, it's, now it's run its course. Yeah, it ran its course. It ran its course. And then for a long time, I when when everybody, before everybody went to the foreclosure auctions, I was down there buying. Once everybody mm-hmm. showed up, I left and started hammering direct mail. I was sending hundreds of thousands of pieces of direct mail using my magic bullet postcard that I designed and was killing it. That ran its course. Mm-hmm. Eventually, everybody catches onto the trends because Pace doesn't shut up. Yeah. He's got a massive community <laughs> and, and he, he tells, tells everybody. everybody what to do and they all go freaking do yeah. it. Next thing you know, he he, yep. he he trains too good. You have first mover advantage. A first means. mover advantage. So where, 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 where was the competitive advantage starting in 2020? AI. 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 And you had to kind of study 
what are the hedge funds doing? What are mm -hmm. big What are big companies that have crazy resources doing? And they're using AI. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, how does a commoner like me use AI? Mm -hmm. It was like, well, let's find a way to build it into our software that we already have in existence. And so we started building and playing around with these propensity and probability models. And we looked at data outside of big data. And there are data banks out there with socioeconomic data, um, demographic trends, moving trends, uh, shopping trends, mm -hmm. uh, you know, political trends, all kinds of stuff. Everything, There's these huge yeah. data banks. And AI can go through 136 billion records. Very quick. Very quick. And based on the, the quality of the algorithm, it can spit out responses to mm -hmm. you. And that, what we try to do is just like a credit score. How do we score every homeowner in the United States? And out of those 130, 40 million records, could we give them a score? Mm. And maybe three scores. We gave them a retail score. Would they be likely to sell for full, like, so if I'm a real estate agent looking for a yeah. listing, would I, out of all these homeowners, who's likely to want to list their property in the next right. 90 days with an agent? Give them a retail score. What's who's likely to want to rent their property mm -hmm. in the next 90 days? Give them a rental score. Who's likely to want to sell at a discount? Give them a wholesale score. And so we started scoring and it took a, a year of the algorithm learning upon itself based on failure and successes. Yeah. And we kept feeding back in the, the wins and it started dialing in the algorithm. And now we can score every homeowner in the United States and very quickly see who has very high likelihood of selling at a discount and it's pretty accurate. And Amazing. now our lead score, lead cost has gone down and that's our competitive advantage we're running with right now, but it's only going to last so long. Can you do it on multifamily? Actually, we do have all the multifamily data and we were working on that. Multifamily obviously is much more difficult. Yes. It's a different ball game. Well, because you're buying, it, I tell people with multifamily, you're buying a business, not a yes, property. That's true. And like single family, I'm buying a property and yeah. I'm going to put a tenant in it. Yeah. Multifamily, I'm acquiring a business Operational that has business, yes. employees and a PL, yeah. which you like to call a T12. I this is I don't make the rules face. I just follow that. Yeah, P and it's, you it's, guys said a bunch of words. You said pay-per-click, you said some other words. I don't even know what they mean. <laughs> like voice ringless voicemail. Like, oh, yeah. I don't know all these things. You're lucky to not have so, to deal with any of that shit. <laughs> you guys have your own language too. So with AI, the cutting advantage is obviously getting involved in AI now because what hap what happens like homebesters, for example. I was a homebester for a couple of years. I was the number one closer. What they do still to this day is they spend money on bus stop ads. Mm -hmm. Billboards. Billboards. Mm -hmm. Radio. Radio. Pay-per-click. Pay-per-click. Okay. <laughs> Facebook ads. All of those things. And then uh, a lot of direct mail. So many of our listeners reach out and they ask us how they can get involved in my actual real estate deals. Our investment firm specializes in finding deeply discounted properties, acquiring them, renovating, stabilizing both single family and multifamily properties all over the United States. That's why we're so excited to share with you clevercapitalfund.com. Now, if you have some investment capital and you want to deploy it and receive double digit returns back by real estate, then visit our website and see which fund is right for you. We have both equity funds and we have debt funds where you just get paid out every month like clockwork. All you got to do is visit www.clevercapitalfund.com today to learn more. Do you know how much that money they spend just in Phoenix, Arizona as a group of 20 people that get together every single month? How much? $600,000 a month in paper and all of those things. They aggregate all the money wow. together. They spend $600,000 a month. Their cost per lead is nearly $2,000 per phone call that comes in. The tech people are still using billboards and bus stops. So you've got people like Cody that are coming out with AI that are mm -hmm. like, really? You guys are going to spend two grand per lead, not two grand per contract. You have to be really good at what you're doing. You have to be a phenomenal close to take a swing at a two thousand dollar pitch. Right. Yeah. Right. So That's what's wild. funny is there's a lot of the industry that is still using the old models. Well, a lot of them. We've just started to see AI be implemented. Like we're in these rooms where we're talking about this and we're sharing this. So it's different for us. But I've talked to people in the last two weeks that are like, what's chat GPT? I'm like, what do you mean? Oh, yeah. What is chat GPT? Oh, yeah. How is this possible? You don't know this. Because I, like I told you the other day, we've already implemented AI across, and we've been using AI for about three and a half years now for some of our model predictions on pro forma in the future because they have millions of data points that they can process and they can based on outputs and inputs and they tell you whether scoring, it's a deal 
Yeah, essentially they do. They tell us how much we can charge for rent five years from now in a specific sub-market. Mm. And that's a huge competitive advantage because maybe I'm underwriting to 200, but the model, the AI model is saying, no, you can get $247. That's a massive difference when you're looking at 200, 400, 500 units at a time. So we've already implemented that. But now to your point, like the front end, the paperwork, the administrative work, all of that is getting completely demolished and revamped by AI. And so there's a lot of people that just aren't even on board yet. And if you're not on board yet, like get on board now. (laughs) Yeah. I think if people want to start fidgeting with AI, great place to start, obviously, is chat GPT. Yeah. Um, just start learning how to become a professional prompter. Yes. Because that's the first step. Is And you can use it to build your personal brand, which is another great topic for us to yes. talk about because you guys are both excellent at building a brand. I'm learning from the best. You are, but you're mm-hmm. doing a great job and you're you're consistent with the content. It looks mm-hmm. fantastic. You, you got some viral clips. I do. Hitting. Some of them thanks to you. Yeah, that's all right. thanks but to you. What's the point? <laughs> what's the point of a viral clip? Yeah, what is the point of it, Cody? I mean, look, because I a lot of people look at content mm-hmm. and they go, "If I don't hit a million views, I guess that that wasn't worthwhile." Oh, I'm like a hundred, and I'm like, "Yes, yeah, that's, viral for me." <laughs> look, you, you, a personal brand is your calling card in 2023 and beyond. Yes, if, or your business card. Like nobody, even dating. One of the first questions they want to trade information your is, "What's your Insta? What's your Insta?" <laughs> they want to look you up. Yeah. And they want to see what your lifestyle is like and they want to see what you're all about and how many mm-hmm. followers you have and what your engagement's like and do I vibe with this person? And Wait, they, people they, care about that they when they're research, dating? They research you. you know, <laughs> I think when you're dating, stuff. for sure, it's got to be what's that What's your engagement like? Yeah. Really? Well, I mean, well, you know what's funny? I even follow my wife throughout her day on my on her Instagram. Yeah. Like even married people are like, what are you doing throughout the day? You kind of track each I'm other. Not my lie, wife. Pace, I follow your wife too. Oh yeah, she's hot, bro. And she's funny as hell. I like what I'm seeing, Pace. You're a lucky man. You're lucky man. He is. She's the best. She is the bomb. Uh, I like his wife more than I like Pace. To be oh, with you. I mean, good move. I tell him yeah. that all the time. So she's the real G. This is nothing she she's doesn't know G. already. So, Spurb, <laughs> what about you and your personal brand? What is the next level for you? Look, I wouldn't even be talking to you guys if I didn't build a personal brand. It was That's the true. best move I made in business. Is it another early seeing technology, First seeing where mover. things were going? I was early to the party, but I saw the value in the in the a- ability to advertise yourself and your business mm-hmm. and get your messaging out there. More for me now, it's about um, impact and the message I want to share because there's a lot of bullshit out there and there's just, you no know, people have such a poor financial intelligence. So I feel like yeah. it's my obligation to share as much of what worked for me as possible. But think about with AI, you don't have to be an expert in all things anymore. No. You just need you to know how to craft the conversation yep. in a way that is authentic to you. So it's like, okay, so and a good example of this is I didn't know much about short sales back in the day. Mm-hmm. But I happened to do a deal where I stumbled into a short sale. This is before the foreclosure meltdown. And I wrote, I documented my experience of doing this short sale. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know what I was doing. I fumbled my way and I didn't even know what a short sale was. So I had to Google what is a short sale and there was limited information online, but I found some stuff and I pieced it together. I said, you know what? I'm going to write a blog article about short sales. And that's what I did. And then I posted it. I, it was out on the web and I forgot all about it. A year later, the world melted down and that article got picked up by Google. SEO cert, you know, everything yeah. was number one. If you put in what is a short sale or how to do a short sale or how to invest in a short sale or how to make money from a short sale, my article came up. And I got an insane amount of leads from that one article. And that's when the the seed was planted. Like, wow, the more t- you content you put out that you don't know who it's going to resonate with. Right. You don't know how they're going to pick it up, when it's going to happen. This is why it's more, it, with Chat GPT, you can come up with a concept that is maybe trending, like right now, 40-year mortgages. Mm-hmm. You can go into chat GPT. You can say, write Instant me a one-minute script about how real estate investors can do creative finance mm-hmm. with 40-year mortgages, for example. It's going to literally write yes. you a really great script that's 85, 90% of the way there. You make it the other 10 or 15, 20% to be authentic to mm-hmm. you in your voice. Mm-hmm. Then you turn on your little camera, you record it, you post it. Yes. And with AI, it'll even do AI-generated captions now. So yeah. it's like you have no excuses not to put out content. Speaking of personal brand, I have a call with A&E and Disney right now. I need to step out for seven minutes. <laughs> 
I, I really do. We can hold out the court. Pa- we'll Pace is floor. on the A and E show, triple digit flip. Dun, 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 dun. They're, so, they're they're talking to us right now at eleven fifteen. I'm a minute late about our next thirty episodes. I'll be right back. We'll hold down the fort. I got we you. We got this. I got you. Um, no, you know what's funny about what you're saying about personal brand and AI. That's the exact reason why I think personal brand is so important right now, because now anybody can generate written content, but who am I listening to say that? That's what's important, right? Because when you put something out about wholesaling, it means a lot more because I know what you do. I know who you are versus Susie Smith or Joe Schmo down the street who just has done one wholesale deal and hasn't built a personal brand around it. Yeah. And I mean, I think when people see you consistently, Mm -hmm. you know, Coca-Cola, why do they spend whatever for a 30 second Super Bowl commercial? Let's call it $7 million, $8 million, whatever crazy number it was. A lot. It's not because they're trying to sell you Coke on on the 30 second commercial. It's brand recognition. It's brand recognition. You're a mortgage person. You're a real estate agent. Mm-hmm. You're a wholesaler. You're in the multifamily mm-hmm. space. You're trying to raise capital at some point mm-hmm. in the future because you follow Vina and you're part of her. What's your community on Facebook? Mastering multifamily with Vina Jetty. I highly recommend <laughs> if you care about not paying taxes, about building an insane amount of wealth, learning from one of the best, maybe getting involved in her projects, but just learning the language of multifamily, how it works. Do two things right now as a favor to yourself and your future. Go listen to the Vina Jetty episode on the Clever Investor oh, Show. Yeah. You killed it. And leave a comment. I'm trying to beat out all the other episodes with comments. There we go. <laughs> leave a comment. So you make Vina happy. And then number two is go over to Facebook and go mm-hmm. to, what is it? Mastering Multifamily with Vina Jetty. That's it. Look up Mastering yes. Multifamily with Vina Jetty. Join her free group. Yeah. Look, community is really important. It is. You know, it, this real we estate- can't talk about community when Pace just walked out. No, this is great. This is when we talk about community. Because <laughs> then we can actually he's say things gonna, about it. He's not going to steal my podcast he's, viewers. Yeah, I mean- They're going to become raving fans of his as soon as they show up. He's the king of community. He's yeah. the goat. He is great. Um, uh, that's because he put in seven, All eight years of, of consistent- work. And he still does. And this is what, this is the problem with people nowadays. They're so fucking entitled mm. and they are so short. Their vision is so short that they don't understand what it really takes to build a personal brand, what it takes to build a community, what yeah. it takes to build that relationship with somebody. People throw money at you, at Pace, at me, because they've seen us so many times. We're being endorsed by all the right people. We're pouring a ton of love into our, our mm-hmm. communities mm-hmm. that they feel like we're all family. And I feel like people are just walking around like giant adults with their umbilical cords in their hands looking to <laughs> plug into something. Well, there's a visual. And that's really what it is. Because when I resonate with you, I'm like, you're my, you are my multifamily mentor. Yeah. And I want to hear all the things you say and what projects you're inv- mm-hmm. involved in and how you analyze the deal. Which, by the way, how is deal flow right now? Like, is it hard to find a good deal it's in your world? It's funny you say that because I have two deals right now that we're negotiating contracts on. So they're big deals. So we're finding more deals. Right now, loan assumptions is really where I think there's a lot of opportunity because there's a lot of loans that were created before 2022 that you can now come in and assume at like two and a half, three and a half, four even 5% interest rates, which make a huge difference on deals of this size. So literally you're a a seller of a multifamily deal. This is a big deal, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming. And Mm -hmm. I'm going to come in and the bank is going to fully underwrite me. Yes. And I'm going to be able to just leave that loan in place. Yeah. Why would they do that? Well, you're assuming the loan product from somebody else. Yeah, but if they can reloan it out at a much higher interest rate, why would they ever do that? The bank, well, the bank's going to charge you a fee to do it, but also this is like a loan with terms. So either you're refinancing completely or you're assuming the loan. The bank gets paid again when you transfer the loan. Got so it. So they're going to make their money yeah, one way or not. Yeah, if you're creditworthy, it makes sense. So they don't care if you're, if they're leaving, if, you know, the interest rate, some phenomenal interest rate because they're going to hit you with a bunch of fees. Yeah, and then eventually it's going to expire and then they're going to relever it again or sell it. And redo it. How do I find those deals? If I knew. <laughs> no, you know, that's the thing is, I, I actually am interested to see your software because I think that there's an application for it in multifamily. And maybe after this, we can look yeah, at it. Yeah, we have all the multifamily data in there. I think it'd be interesting to be able to kind of see who's owned it. You'll be able to find it really knowing when people purchased the asset because most loans generated in 2020, 2021, we're probably on some kind of bridge debt. So then it's, okay, do you have rate cap insurance? Because if they have rate cap insurance, they're probably not that worried right now. 
But if they don't, yeah, they're now in a free fall or about to jump off a cliff. Do you feel that- like there's going to be a lot of foreclosures or defaults in the multifamily Gosh, space? I hope not because these passive investors are the ones that are really going to get hurt here, um, which I think is always tough, right? Because they're people. And the problem is, is when you have an LP or a limited partner that loses money, right? They're passive investors. They don't have any control over the deal. When they lose money, they no longer want to invest in real estate. And that's harder for us, for people like us who operate our deals to go out and raise capital because now there's so many people that are just never going to put money in real estate ever again. Yeah. So I think that that's, sucks. yeah, that's a problem. That's why I was saying like, you know, real estate tourists really made it hard because in Dallas, for example, that's my home market. I haven't bought there in like five years because nothing priced out. And now I'm like, oh, hey, maybe now I'll be able to buy things in Dallas again, which it's a great market. It's a hot market. The fundamentals are still the same. When you, and I don't, you know, I just want like your general overarching opinion. When you see guys like Grant Cardone buying like a class A, Mm -hmm. really nice new building at a very low cap rate, like when you see something like that, are you like, oh yeah, I totally understand his business model. I understand the the deal. This all makes sense to me. Or are you like, ooh, that's risky? Um, it, you know, without being able to like speak to any specific deal, his business model is that he plans to hold for a thousand years. And that's what I was saying to Pace, right? Is like with enough time, the market goes up and down. It will eventually go up. If you look at real estate historically, it's always gone up overall. There might be certain dips in the market, but if you can weather those storms, then you know it's not really that big of a deal because even at today's cap, that's fine. But more, there are more and more renters. He's buying these really beautiful locations where the fundamentals are still strong. So he might face pressure in short term on some of the assets. I don't know the details of them. Yeah, if he put good long term debt in there, then maybe yeah, he's not going to have. But over the, the long, same issues. yeah, over the long term, it's probably going to go up in value. Are rents going down? Rents are not going down in our markets. What What's happening is they're not growing as quickly as they used to. So when we used to go into an asset and think we could charge an extra, let's call it $300, right? We go in, we renovate, we make the apartment really beautiful. And we say, okay, we're not going to charge you $1,200 anymore. Now it's $1,500. What's happening now in today's market is I might not be able to get $1,500, but maybe I can get like Fourteen hundred or thirteen seventy five, and the problem is a lot of people bought with a super aggressive rent growth assumptions, and that causes issues. When okay, you planned on fifteen hundred, now you're getting a hundred dollars less or one hundred fifty dollars less. Now what? Mm, right, that's ten yeah. percent off of your rent. That's a big delta, and multifamily is so sensitive to the NOI and the cap rate in the area that even a dollar, like at a 5% cap, every dollar of additional bottom line income is a $20 addition in the value of the asset. Say that again, because I think people need to understand this concept. So if, let's say I go into a property and I add $1 to the bottom line. So not the top line revenue, the bottom line. So after expenses, everything, I add $1. At a 5% cap rate, that means that my property has now increased by $20. So you know, if you add ten dollars, mm-hmm. it's increasing by two hundred dollars, right? You keep adding zeros to it proportionally, and that means that there's a massive change at a five percent cap rate. Yeah, huge. And, and what are you? What kind of cap rates are you seeing out there right now? Right now, on like Class B plus A minus assets, we're starting to see like kind of upper fours, depending on again why the seller's selling. You might see them sell at a slightly higher cap if they are panicking or in a free fall on their debt terms or about to jump off a cliff with debt terms. So it kind of depends, but I'd say high fours. And what are your favorite markets that you're looking for deals in? Arizona. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we like Texas, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Arizona. But we are implementing AI technology now to help us get a better first mover advantage on markets that are like where Dallas was five years ago or seven years ago, where it was like just starting to kind of get hot. So we're utilizing AI technology to tell us like, okay, you should go and buy in Columbus, Ohio. And so we're, yeah, we're, we're implementing AI, Cody. I told you you're late to the game. (laughs) Um, um, Catch up, catch up with us. I think people are going to be really creative with all the different ways they, they apply it. I mean, it's mind-blowing what you can do. Now, my husband, on the other hand, 
you know, he's not in real estate. He's, he doesn't operate a business like this. So he doesn't really see the AI applications as much as we do. And so I'm like, and he knows what chat GPT is, right? Like he's been using it. And he's like, using, he's like, babe, I've been using chat GPT every day. I'm like, okay, what are you using it for? Like, tell me all the things, like, how is it applicable in what you're doing? And he's like, every day I ask it to tell me a dad joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I got, like, <laughs> dude, I got some good ones on deck right now for, okay, we're let, doing let's a live hear event. I let's hear them. Yeah. Let's see here. We're going to see if any of these resonate. These are three, three or four new But ones. I was like, Google can do this too. You didn't have to wait for ChatGPT to get a dad joke. Ready for this one? All right, let's hear it. Uh, I've been taking Viagra for my sunburn. It doesn't cure it, but it does keep the sheets off my legs at night. <laughs> Come on, that's even, good. That's not, that's, a, a, that's not a dad joke. Yeah, that's pretty good. Is that a dad joke? Okay, wait, yeah, let me here's one about Cole, right? Um, about Cole. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, because I always make fun of Cole at my live events. Um, you know that you know that Cole used to run a dating site for chickens, but he struggled to make hens meet. Ah, <laughs> I like that. I appreciate it. Good that's one. a dad joke. Okay, wait, let me give you one. Okay, remember when plastic surgery was such a taboo subject? Now you mention Botox, and no one raises an eyebrow. See, that's a good one. That's a dad I, joke. All right, you need to send that one to me. Um, uh, Greg, our video guy, he's forbidden me from making any more breakfast puns. He says that if I do, I'm toast. Uh, <laughs> but he keeps that's egging a, me on. He's such uh, a ham. I see what you did there, Cody. There you go. Okay, there I'll you give go. you a last one because it's a landlord one. Okay, my landlord wanted to talk to me about why my heating bill is so high. I told her my door is always open. Boom. That's actually a good one. <laughs> All right. Last one. You, I said that was last one. No, that's one. your last okay, one. Fine. I you got give one me your more. Last one. This better be better than mine because both of mine were this better than This is a remodeling joke. No, I'm, I got to tell two because this was not that much better. All right. <laughs> Brian, my business partner, just finished remodeling his bathroom. He learned through tile and air. Ah, see, I like puns. So Those I like good these. Ones. That was a good one. My wife said to me, I hate myself because I look fat. Can you give me a compliment? I said, honey, you have perfect eyesight. <laughs> come on. Come on. Come on. We got to work these out. So this can be just like a whole podcast about just bad, dad jokes. bad dad jokes. Yeah. Well, now we know chat GPT can maybe find me some yeah. better ones. So if you wanted to know the application you were missing for chat GPT, this there, is it. That's what he uses yes, it for. This You're, is what he uses it for. And he's a, like, he's an anesthesiologist yes. and he's just on there doing bad dad jokes. But I read this thing the other day that um, there was a patient who had seen like doctors and neurologists for six months trying to get a diagnosis and a relative put all of her symptoms and everything, all the information they had into chat GPT and it spit out a rare diagnosis. They confirmed it with labs and now she's being treated. Wow. But the impact that AI is going to have in the future, like we don't even know yet because this is just like, the very first infant stages of AI. And every time there's an input and an output, it gets better because it learns from itself. Yeah, it's brilliant. And so- it scares the shit out of me. I'm yeah, not going to lie. Terrifying. This is why I'm like, guys, b build wealth at warp speed right, right now. Right now. And- This you is know, the get, moment. Yeah, this is the moment. This and is the moment. Go as fast as and aggressive as you can. The, the, there's a lot of scary things happening out there. Many. The, there's so much uncertainty and chaos and so much change coming- and uh, kids don't want to go to college anymore. No. Right? I mean, I'm Indian, so your, like, your I kids, kind of want everyone to go to college still to go to a college. little bit. Just a little, though. Yeah, not but they much. might not want to. I know. I, you know, I'm actually more What would you do? What would you do if your, your kids were like, I'm out. I'm not doing that. Go start a business and be great. I, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, so I don't think that like college is the end all to be all. Unless you want to be like a surgeon, right? And like you absolutely cannot do it without going to college. I don't really think a lot of people should go to college for entrepreneurship or business. Yeah. Everything's at our fingertips now. Well, just buy, buy, get in the real estate game as aggressively as you can. I mean, I would, if it, the choice was between my kids going to college or being in the right rooms, 10 out of 10 would pick be in the right rooms because that changed my life so much. You, you yeah, changed one, my life yeah, from 100%. that. Yeah, 100%. 
Yeah. Like you told me there were rooms I didn't even know that were there. Like no one told me these rooms were there. <laughs> and you were like, Vina, like, come on in. And I was like, there is a lot of self-education going on. I've learned more through self-education ever than I did in oh, school. I had zero sure. interest in traditional school. But college was fun, right? Like it's the time eh. where you get to be like eh. a baby adult. Eh. Really? Not I loved me. college. I mean, I had the Navy time. was fun. I was traveling all over the world, hooking up with chicks. <laughs> Some people just getting do that paid, in college. Getting paid for it. <laughs> yeah, but you don't get paid for it in college. True. You don't get paid for it. Paid you for pay it. you pay to do it in college. Yeah. Um, all right. So let let's I want to talk about raising money real quick because you are an expert at raising mm. money. Um in the in the landscape that we're in right now, you know, with interest rates high and financing tough and all that stuff. We have to raise a lot more money oh, so now than more. we used to, right? Yeah. So like how does somebody who's maybe newer, like what advice would you give them to start raising capital? Mm. Like, cause it's, are you, the biggest mindset shift for me was when I realized that I wasn't borrowing money from anybody. Yeah. That and was I a don't big, know why. That was a big light bulb moment. Cause in the beginning I was like, first off, I don't know any rich people. And second off, why would anybody lend me money? Yeah. And then my mentor sat me down and said, you're thinking about it wrong. Mm -hmm. You're not borrowing money from anybody. You're creating opportunity. You're in, you're, you're showing them an opportunity and, yeah. and they'll make their own decisions. And if it's a good opportunity, the money will come. Yeah. Because think about it. I, like I invest with you, right? And why do I invest with you? Because you know the things that I don't and will never and don't ever want to know about new development, Airbnb, fix and flip. I don't, I don't think we've invested in any wholesale stuff with you, but I'd be interested in seeing if that was a possibility because I don't know anything about it, but I want my money to be diverse. And so I want to earn money in multifamily. And then I want to go and spread it out because I want to hedge all my risk. And so I go and I find, and this is why being in the rooms is so important because I want to be around the people that are the best at what they do. And so I think to your point, raising capital, the first thing someone should do is be in the right rooms because you need a network. This is a relationship game. There's no doubt about it. Be in the right rooms, learn, you know, educate. And, you know, again, to your point, I hate saying this. I'm like big, big grudgingly saying this, that, you know, college did not teach me about IRRs and equity multiples and leverage and all these things. So, you know, be in these rooms or be in these spaces and consume this education and this content that's so readily available nowadays. And, you know, I did a course for you and mm -hmm. that goes through all of this, right? So like something like that will give you all of the fundamentals so that now you can speak knowledgeably. You can go and tell people what you're doing, um, create those relationships, be intentional about those relationships. Um, I, and I think you, and I can speak for Pace and I, I know all of us, we're, we only spend our time with other successful people. Like we do not try to spend time like just hanging out, doing nothing with people who aren't doing at least as much or more than us, right? Yeah, unless they got good weed. I mean. And then I'm back in. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll trust you on this one. <laughs> I'll just trust you. I on keep this. doing weed jokes, and everybody's going to think I'm a pothead, and I I don't even smoke weed. Is that true? No, no I mean I do smoke weed, but I <laughs> I'm not out smoking weed like during the day. Like you're not doing it right now. No, I'm not. Like right, right at now. this moment, he's no, not I mean, smoking. Do you have weed. any? <laughs> no, <laughs> I didn't know where we were going with this. I mean, where I don't. I don't smoke. What kind weed. of podcast is this? <laughs> trying to raise millions of dollars here. I swear. Yeah, I got I got my wits. About so me. I don't think this is how you raise. This is what <laughs> not to do when you're raising millions of dollars. Um, no, but it's creating those relationships. It's all relationships, and it's consistency. Um, explain the difference between an accredited and a non-accredited person. Yes. Because when it comes to multifamily or any major Anything. raising, you need to know the difference yes. between accredited and non-accredited. Yeah, which is also why I say. Your securities attorney, I said this on the last show, right? Like yeah. your securities attorney is the first call that you make all the time ever. If you're even thinking about raising capital, that's the time to make this call because there are certain exemptions that you're going to rely on. And, you know, there was a time where I used to raise under one exemption. And then, you know, I called Nick for the next raise and he goes, okay, wait, let's talk about maybe making the switch to 506C raise. And I was like, oh, okay, let's talk about it. I, didn't think about that. I thought we'd just do it the same way we had always done it. And we made the switch several years back. And now that's all we do is 506C raises. So you definitely want to reach out to your securities attorney 
first. Um, and Nick is on his way in town, so he's going to be speaking at your mastermind. Perfect. Um, we have a in-office experience that's happening it's here be so tomorrow with 90 yes. people. Yes. That all, yeah, they all paid a thousand bucks to have a power day in the office. We got a networking mixer kicking off tonight. Yep. And uh, I do these these little events every once in a while where I bring in the experts like Vina. Yes. She's brought in Nick, her securities yes. attorney. Yeah. We got Pace training. We got Carlos yeah. Reyes training on uh, systems and scaling. I'm going to talk about you know some brand building stuff and also what's working in wholesaling, novations. We're going to train on novations. I love it. I think it's important, speaking of getting in the right room, you know, back, I would have paid so much more to learn this yes. stuff than $1,000. I was buying the wackest fucking courses back in the day. I would go to these giant Amazing. expos. Like yeah. this was like in 2004 and five. Like tens of thousands oh, of people. Oh, was, dude, 40,000 people. Ooh. Like it was insanity okay. in LA. Like their whole Staples Center, everything was packed. And there'd be like, Al Lowry and all these old school gu gurus and their courses were actually three ring binders, but like 12 of them. <laughs> and Tell me you're old DVDs, without telling me you're yeah, old, DVDs Cody. DVDs <laughs> and books and tapes. And it'd be like $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 for mm -hmm. these books and tapes. And I was just throwing my credit card up on stage trying to like buy these things because I was so desperate to learn. And none of them are even close to as good at real estate as you. So okay. to be able to come and be in the room to learn this kind of stuff is invaluable. I appreciate that. I actually think you did it smarter than I did because do you know I've never paid for a mentorship or a course ever outside of college? I've never paid. Yeah, you paid for the most expensive. <laughs> yeah, I did that. <laughs> with, no, with little to no ROI. Yeah, probably no. Uh, but <laughs> but what I will say uh, is I took the very long scenic route to get into these rooms. And now I'm like, man, if I had done this like even like five years Bought before. Bought some courses. Yeah, got right like, into just it. like gotten into a mastermind or gotten into a power day like we're going to do, like what would I have been able to do and how much faster? And because growth is not linear, it's exponential, right? Like getting to your first million is the hardest and getting to two million is a little bit easier and then getting to five million is easier and then it's easier to get to 10 million. And it's because once you know how to make a million dollars, now you know how to make the next million and the next million, the next million. And so I just wish I had thrown my credit card up on stage and gotten all the things because I think I would have been able to use that knowledge earlier and just been way more impactful earlier on. But I just didn't know. I thought that people were paying to like learn what NOI was. And I was like, well, I can like Google that. I don't really need to spend $5,000. If you that. buy the right course or you put yourself in the right room, you're really trying to plug into a system. That's a, all a it is. A systematic approach. Yep. Even on YouTube, it's like such a plethora of concepts all you know, yeah. 10 minute videos of all these different concepts. It's inefficient. Well, and that's you the thing. You're plugging into like a that. system, but you're also plugging into FaceTime with the people in those rooms, right? Because I don't know about you, but I've invested with people that I've met at these 100%. events, right? And so you want to know where to raise capital. Like I am at these events. I speak at these events. I want to invest in your deals. That's the first place to start is go where the money is and be in these rooms, talk to people, tell people what you're doing. And you asked what an accredited investor is. So this is a whole long uh, lead up to what an accredited investor is. So an accredited investor, primarily people are going to meet it in one of two ways. They're going to be either a single person with an income of 200000 or more for the last two years with a reasonable expectation of maintaining it. Or if you're married, it's 300000 or more for the last two years. If you can't meet that, you could also meet it's an or, it's not and, it's or, you could have a net worth of a million dollars or more, excluding the equity in your primary home. So if you live in California, you cannot count the equity in your home toward your net worth calculation. And the reason that's important is there's different types to raise money. Like you yes. can't just go online yeah. and be like, hey, I'm raising $5 million right now. Throw money at me. One of the biggest mistakes do I, yeah, one of the biggest mistakes I made is I did exactly that. Mm -hmm not really online, but I was like, just telling everybody like, yeah. give me money, give me money, give me money. Yeah. And then I didn't have a fund. I didn't have any real legitimate paperwork. Like we- You had no way to actually functionally- Well, what, what it, it's, money. you know, whenever you take funds and you put a bunch of people's funds into one bank account- Yeah, you're selling a security. <laughs> yeah, you're selling a security. <laughs> yeah. 
but I didn't understand that. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people if don't. you do it for like, you know, I did it with maybe like 10 or 15 people, put, we pulled money together. And I was out buying foreclosures and doing all kinds of stuff. This is back in like 2008. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the people that gave me money went through a divorce. Mm-hmm. And he called me up one day yep. and he said, Cody, I need my money back. And it was only like $100,000 or something yeah. like that. And I said, sorry, dude, it's in properties. So yeah. Like it's, yeah, when this thing sells, like I know where the money is. Like yeah. we have these, like, let's call it 10 properties. Right. It's in one of them. spread out of yeah. all these 10 properties. Whichever right. one sells you can first, I'll start giving your money back. But you, I, I can't liquidate. It doesn't yeah. happen like that with real, real estate. Real estate is not a liquid asset. Yeah. And so he, he said, no, I need my money. I need it like now. You said you would give it back. And I'm like, yeah, when the property sells, like yeah. I got you. Like you're first in no line. Worries. The next day, a securities attorney calls me. He went and Oh, up. no. And she, knowing what a fucking disaster of a mistake I this made. This was, yeah. She, was she like, laid out her case. And by the time I was done, I thought I was going to prison for the rest of my life. Oh. I was like, oh my God, I fucked up. They're taking everything. You and she did. was like, we're going to audit every financial. Oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. She scared me so bad. I magically came up with this dude's hundred thousand. So weird, how you did that? I don't know how I did it, <laughs> but I was well, like, "Here's your money back," because I was just praying she didn't dig in deeper. And then all eight or nine or ten yeah. people all of a sudden are pissed off at me. So uh, that was a big lesson. I never yeah. did that again. I was like, I need but, to learn how to raise money the right way. Yes, because I actually had an investor that went through a very nasty divorce, and so this is what I love about Nick and hate about him simultaneously is he's so freaking conservative about everything he does that I'm like, okay, it's unlikely that there is going to be an earthquake in China that is going to disrupt my property in North Carolina. So no, we don't need to disclose this risk, right? But that's how conservative he is. But it's really great when you need it. So Mm -hmm. when we, let's see, I think this must have been, this is like several years ago. And he made us get a spousal consent signature from the spouse. And so all of our investors, if you were not investing through an entity or trust, and you're like, if you were investing, you would have to have your spouse sign if you were married. And it didn't matter where you were. And he was like, just get them to sign. I'm like, but this is just another hurdle. And you know how it is when Mm -hmm. you're in a sales process, you want as little friction as possible to close the deal. And so I'm like, no, I want it to be like super easy for our investors. He's like, no, trust me, go get this done. I was like, fine, I'll do it. And so I had an investor. I got his wife to sign the documents. They invested the money. I was like, okay, great. Three, two and a half years in, they go through this nasty, like bad divorce. One of the worst I think I've heard about, but I mean, what do I know? I don't hear about divorces that often. So it's a low bar anyway. Um, but so he, they go through his divorce and all of a sudden I get a demand letter from her attorney saying, and I think they had maybe like a hundred grand, 50 grand, hundred grand, something like that invested. And they were like, we want the money. We didn't agree to this. We're not part of this. It, we were awarded this by the court in our divorce proceedings. And I responded back and I go, I'm so sorry. I think that there's been some misunderstanding because this is an illiquid investment. You can't just like sell it like a stock on the stock market. And the attorney was like, no, but we didn't agree to this, whatever. And so, you know, I pull out the PPM and I email a copy and I say, maybe your client hasn't given this to you, but her signature is here on this page, literally agreeing to all the terms of this, knowing that it's an illiquid investment. And the attorney goes, I'll discuss with my client. Thanks. Never heard from them again. Never heard from them again. Because it's huge. And this is what it's designed to do. It's designed to protect us, but it's also designed to protect the investor. Because really, if you want to be like super technical, right, is all investors in the same share class have to be treated equally. So if you redeemed one investor out of this fund, I'll call it, or this deal, very technically speaking, since they're all kind of in the same position, you should have offered to redeem all of them, which quickly creates a big problem, Mm. right? And so that's what these disclosures are really important for. It protects you. It protects them. Everybody knows what they're getting into or theoretically should know what they're getting into. If you don't read the PPM, like that's on you. Um, But I think that's why it's important. 
where would you recommend? I want to end with this, just like maybe a little advice for newer people mm-hmm. that are kind of lo- listening to this podcast. They're like, wow, we, we covered a lot of ground. We did. And we're, we're just leaving Pace out. He's he's negotiating his next he's, 300 episodes yes. to become the most famous real estate investor of all ever, times. Ever, ever. Um, uh, we talked about AI. We talked about some creative stuff. We talked about a little bit about brand building. Where, From your point of view, where would somebody start? They're listening to this. Obviously, they're going to go to your Facebook group. Yes. Get plugged in. Yes. How would they get started in multifamily? Like, what's that path for a new person that maybe doesn't have a lot of resources or they're just new and they're overwhelmed and a little scared to yeah, I do mean, anything on their own? It can be overwhelming. These are big deals we're talking about, right? Um, Pace does a lot of multifamily content on his YouTube channel and in his group. And I, you know, educate there, but I also come into your groups, educate there. So I think those are really great places to start. Like you said, a thousand dollars to be in this room that we're going to be talking in for two days. Like I'm going to go through the basics. We're going to talk about like, here's why multifamily makes sense and why now is the time to be in multifamily. So I think like that, number one, be in, be in those rooms. And there are a lot of free meetups. You can go to like real estate meetups. You don't have to pay the thousand dollars to get in the room. You can go to free real estate meetups, go out there and network. In my Facebook group, everybody networks with each other. They meet for Zoom, coffee, they hang out, they talk to you. It's a community, right? And so- um, go and be in those spaces. Immerse yourself with these people. Don't spend your time. Like, Pace and I talk about this all the time, right? Like, I don't go to hang out with people who aren't doing anything or who aren't moving their life forward because, like, I don't want that energy around me. I want to be around people where I'm like, oh my gosh, you built this whole like scoring system. Like I need a scoring system. Like that's what I'm thinking now because I'm in proximity to someone who's doing something better than me or more than me. And so you need to be in those places. This is like so much a mindset game, more so than anything else. It's mindset, right? And it's consistency and showing up and you're going to fail. You're going to make mistakes. You might raise what was it? A million dollars for 10 people without a PPM. That's a big mistake. You don't have to make those mistakes when you're in the right room because someone's going to tell you like, no, 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 Cody, (laughs) this is not the right way. Right. And so, um, I think showing up in those rooms is the first and most important thing. Second is investing into that education, whether it's your time, money, or both, right. Is putting the work in to get that basic knowledge base and to be in those rooms means that you already have taken the first step of investing in yourself, but continue investing in yourself because I didn't do it. And I've earned my way into all of these rooms. And I will tell you, if I knew I could cut a check, I would have done it years ago. I just didn't know I could cut the check into these rooms. Um, and I think too, there when you have questions, ask them. Ask them because even if I don't answer them. Like in my group, if someone asks a question, there are a hundred people that are one step ahead of you. And then when you learn them, my ask for my community is always the same. When you learn something, go out and teach it to somebody else because that's how we solidify what we learn, right? It's how somebody else who maybe needed to hear you say something, it could be the exact same thing I said, but they needed to hear you say it in order for it to like really resonate and click. So it's important that you go out and continue sharing that knowledge. It's the ripple effect. I know for all three of us, this is the best way for us to reach the impact that we really want to reach. We can't do it alone. We need the people around us to help us make that impact. I love this. So what I'm hearing you say is find a community, get plugged in. Don't be scared to cut the check, get get the training that you need. And most important, get out there and start taking massive action. Start doing it. Take action. And, you know, a great way to start if you're if you're just new and you don't know what the heck you're doing is go find a fourplex or something like that and move into one of the damn units uh, and rent hack. out the other three and house, house hack your way into a yeah. little multifamily deal so you can at least be in the game. So do you know we don't count fourplexes as multifamily? I get it. But I mean, just- I just want to be clear. I know. Because I'm here. I can't let okay, you just fiveplex. say Okay, fiveplex. A fiveplex. All right. We're now in the commercial world. <laughs> now you're in multifamily. <laughs> yeah, no. No, I, but I, I think that, and I think it's important too, when we say like invest in yourself in the education- don't do it if you're not going to do step three, which is taking massive action, right? Because then you're just wasting your money. But if you take the action and you- You know what though? I will challenge you oh, on that what? because I would totally buy your course or get involved with something in the multifamily space if my intention wasn't to be a multifamily investor, but to put money with you. But that's still taking action. Oh, no, that's true. 
Yeah, it's, yeah, because but I don't want to do multifamily, but I want to give you all my money so you can make me rich. Awesome. I want all your money to make you rich. Yeah, so let's go. This is like a great match. <laughs> um uh and by the way, Pace's community, since he's not here to plug himself, mm. I gotta see I gotta do fucking everything for this guy. You he's know, such it, dead weights. Yeah, no, she's a wheeze. It's the sub two community on Facebook. No, yeah, it's or, or it's creative, creative finance with financing. Pace Morby. <laughs> but you'll also find if you look at sub two. Find his YouTube. His YouTube is really good. His YouTube is great. It's so yeah, he's good. Killing it. And he puts out like, I don't even know how he can create this much content. It cannot be humanly possible. You yeah, too. The, you create nah, a ton of content. The guy's a machine. I, it's really impressive to watch him maneuver. 70% um, of my day is just watching both of you guys talk on YouTube or Instagram or TikTok. That, that's it? <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, Perfect. I, you have so much content. <laughs> um, and uh, Vina, how do we get a hold of you? Uh, Vina Jetty on Instagram and TikTok. J-E-T-T-I. V-E-E-N-A-J-E-T-T-I. And then my multi- Mastering Multifamily with Vina Jetty Facebook group. Bam. Dude, they got to go follow you. You're an absolute Bye. beast. Um, and yeah, you know, I'm glad I, we had a little real estate talk with these yes. two phenomenal human beings. If you got some value from this, make sure you share this episode with somebody else that's maybe aspiring to get into mm. creative real estate investing. It changed my life. I was on the path to being a bookkeeper. Uh, <laughs> and that's what I was doing, which is like the worst job ever. Sorry, bookkeepers. Um but, but if you're uh, selling khaki- a bookkeeping company, let us know because we might buy it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, uh, but for me, it wasn't it wasn't a good path. It didn't didn't create financial freedom, but real estate investing changed my life. And and this is why mm-hmm. we're so passionate about sharing this financial intelligence with others. Because once you get exposed to it, it's impossible to go back. It's look, it's not your fault because maybe you didn't have successful people around you mm. or mentors around you. And up until that moment where you're exposed to it. I'll give you a pass. It's not your fault. The second you're exposed, it becomes your fault. You got to take extreme ownership from that day forward. And if you're not where you want to be in life, it's because you don't have the right skills and capabilities. You don't have the right relationships. You don't, you're not actually taking massive action and creating those success habits. Cause I'm telling you this, there's nobody that's going to come and roll out the red carpet for you. You're going to have to figure out a side door, a creative way to get in there. You're going to have to serve your way into these circles or cut a big check to get into these circles. And even if you do cut the check, that doesn't guarantee your success. You still no, got to put in a lot of sacrifice action. and work. And it's, I, I call it paying your success tax. Yes. You know, it's dues. You got to pay your dues. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I promise you on the other end of it is that freedom that you're looking for. That's why I said, one of the first questions I ask somebody new getting into this business is how are you going to fire yourself from the real estate game? Where's that end point? And if that end point for you is $10 million and 50K a month, and you're going to sit on a beach and drink drinks with umbrellas in them, then great. Let's start there, Let's work our way that. backwards yep. and figure out how to use real estate as the tool to get us there. And I'm telling you, there's not many vehicles that will get you there as fast mm-hmm. as real estate. So you're at the right place. Until next time, we're out of here. Take care, comb your hair. Peace. Hey, thanks for being a subscriber of the Clever Investor Show. As a thank you gift, we wanted to give you something that we know is gonna help you get started as a creative real estate investor. It's our real estate success kit and it's completely free. Just go to www.reisuccesskit.com to customize your kit, but essentially it's a collection of 15 training tools designed to help you get results quickly as a creative real estate investor. From systems to lead generation, to finding cash buyers, to creative ways to close deals and get paid. Your free REI success kit is just a few clicks away. Once again, the website's www.reisuccesskit.com.